welcome to Channels Television's continuing coverage uh, of this Democracy Day 2021, June 12, 2021. My name is Ladi Akiri Dulwali. On this segment, uh, as you probably heard earlier, we'll be taking a look at some of the lessons and if we've learned them uh, of uh, the June 12 crisis and the June 12 struggle, uh, which uh, kicked off with that momentous election on June the 12th, 1993. Uh, 28 years on, uh, where are we in the march to democracy? Where is our country on that march? Uh, we're going to be taking a, a, a bit of a look at that within the next uh, 55 minutes or, or thereabouts. So uh, let's kick it off straight away. We're going to have uh, uh, two gentlemen join us. But before they join us uh, right here live uh, in the studios, uh, let's hear what the president, uh, Mohammed Buhari, uh, had to say uh, this Democracy Day. It's three years now since the president declared June 12 as Democracy Day and a work-free day in Nigeria in honor of the winner of the 1993 presidential election and for all those who fought for the sustenance of democracy. And to mark this day, the president addresses the nation. He begins by celebrating the country for what he calls the freedom that exists and for the unity of Nigeria as a country. He goes on to acknowledge the can-do spirit of Nigerians, which according to him, has kept the country together, promising to reinvigorate the fight against insecurity and insurgency. I join you all today to commemorate and celebrate our Democracy Day. It is a celebration of freedom and a victory for one people, one country, and one Nigeria. Once again, I want to render my sincere and heartfelt condolences to the families and friends of our gallant servicemen and women who lost their lives in the line of duty and a sacrifice to keep Nigeria safe. The president also insists that he's committed to going after those behind what he calls the senseless arsons, kidnapping and murders across the country, saying he shares the pain of families and direct victims of ransom-seeking criminals. Let me assure my fellow citizens that every incident However minor, gives me great worry and concern, and I immediately order security agencies to swiftly but safely rescue victims and bring perpetrators to justice. Fellow Nigerians, when you elected me as your president in 2015, you did so knowing that I will put an end to the growing insecurity especially the insurgency in the Northeast, but the unintended consequences of our scattering them in the Northeast push them further in country, which is what we are now facing and dealing with. On the economy, he lists the intervention of the government and the Central Bank of Nigeria in driving economic growth over the last six years, targeted mostly on agriculture, power, and healthcare. The economic sustainability plan, our rebound plan for the COVID-19 pandemic developed in 2020 is currently being executed. The plan is primarily focused on the non-oil sector, which has recorded phenomenal growth, contributing over 90% to the GDP growth in the first quarter of 2021. Though marginal, we have recorded GDP growth over two quarters, second quarter of 2020 and first quarter of 2021. This is evidence of a successful execution of the economic sustainability plan by the federal government. The president closes his address by acknowledging the agitation for constitutional reforms, 
asking Nigerians to look towards the National Assembly for constitutional amendment as it's within their purview to do so. He promises to hand over a free and fair electoral process as well as restating his commitment to the pursuit of a fair society where everyone can feel proud. All right, uh, there you have it. The president uh, given an overall picture of where he sees the country uh, today, uh, 12th of uh, June 2021, Democracy Day. Uh, joining me in the studio here uh, first in Lagos uh, is the uh, Minister of uh, Youth and Sports, uh, Mr. Sonny Dari. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming in. Thanks a lot. Uh, going to Abuja, uh, joining us from our Abuja studios uh, is uh, human rights activist, uh, constitutional lawyer, and uh, High Chief Mike Ozekome. Thank you so much for your time. Welcome uh, to the program. I can't hear anything. Oh, dear. It seems as if we're having uh, a bit of a problem uh, with uh, Chief Ozekome, but I'm sure we'll fix that in just a jiffy. <coughs> Let me begin with um, uh, Mr. Dari in uh, Lagos. Of course, as you can note, we're talking now about lessons of June 12. That's where I want us to start. Right. Uh, quite a number of things happened on June 12 and in the immediate uh, aftermath of June 12. Uh, some of those I've spoken to have talked about, even up to a five-year period, there were still lessons. Do you think we've taken those lessons and translated them into the democr uh, democracy that we're practicing now? Well, absolutely. You know, democracy is a culture, and it's grown over time. There were lessons even before June 12, because June 12 happened because certain processes took place. Nigerians woke up to a country in which they desired true democracy, undiluted. That's why you saw what happened on June 12th. What happened then was simply ethnicity, religion, took backstage. And Nigerians looked at merit. Who are those that had the credential to lead the country forth? And then June 12th happened. And then there were lessons learned after the annulment. We saw the protest. We saw a near revolutionary process that occurred. We saw the governization of the civil society, of the critical media. Virtually, the church, the, uh, the religious organizations, virtually every segment of the Nigerian society was united in saying, we voted on that day. This country deserves a new lease of life. The military must go. Now, the lessons of June 12 do abide. They abide. Have we imbibed? the lessons in its entirety? No. 28 years down the road, the singular fact that we've returned to the path of democracy, we've had successive democratic elections and precedents, clearly you see that's one of the benefits of the spirit of June 12. But beyond that, we've seen the political culture also grow. Beyond just people getting elected, the process of election at various levels, representatives from the local government, to the state and to the federal, the National Assembly and the rest. Now, that is going to continue. Do we expect to see some things change? Absolutely. In terms of the people that lead the country, we want to see, and I'm sure you're going to get to that later, we want to see a number of our youth also processed through the political system so that they can begin to lead and take charge. Let me put you on pause and go to our Abuja studios where I understand that uh, High Chief Michael Zekome can now hear me and... Uh, can therefore join our discussion. Uh, Chief Ozekome, welcome to the program. Let me uh, pose to you the same question I've just posed to the Honorable Minister, which is, do you think that we have taken some of the, uh, 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 the can, we, can, can we say that some of the lessons of June 12, the lessons that came from the June 12 experience have been imbibed in this democratic practice that we have? Uh, I don't think so at all. We have not. Uh, I beg to disagree with the, with the Honorable Minister, the youthful Minister of Youth and Sports. We have not. If we have, why are we in a sorry state today? If we have, why have we retrogressed 
rather than progressed. If we have, why have we at best suffered the fate of the barber's chair of perpetual motion without progress? On June 12th, for history, Nigerians came out and voted unanimously, men and women, Christians and Muslims. Guess what, Akure Duluari? It was a Muslim, Muslim ticket. Chief MKO Abiola and Ambassador Babagana King Gibe on the SDP ticket. The party won and even defeated the NLC ticket of Al Haji Bashir Tofa. Even defeated him in his Al Basa Jadi Jadi voting unit in Kano. Uh, Chief Ozekum, I understand that there's a bit of an issue with uh, your audio. Uh, so we'll just put you on pause for just a moment. Uh, and and uh, while we, yeah, you can hear us, but you can hear us, but. We're having difficulty in hearing you at this end. So just give us a minute or two to correct that. We'll come back to you. So uh, back to you, Minister. Uh, if we're going to take it forward, uh, while we wait to fix uh, uh, Chief Ozekome's uh, situation there, if we're to take it forward, if we've taken the lessons, what more can we do to ensure that the crisis that was the aftermath of June 12th does not rear its head again, particularly because the younger generation, which may or may not have been aware of what happened then, and the result that is the democracy that we have now, right. are also becoming more and more aware. They're becoming more and more agitated. Well, I think that answer lies in examining what actually made June 12 happen. What political process made June 12 happen? Who are those in charge of that process? What were the characteristics of that process in terms of transparency, in terms of even the party politics, how people rose up through the rank and file to pick, to win a primaries, to get a ticket to contest for different elections? And I think that was the most important thing, the transparency of the process. Our electoral process must continue as it has a matured to be transparent to serve every Nigerian that aspires to an elective office. Yes, we look at the presidential election alone, but it was, it was a whole process. Before the presidential election, you had the senators and the rest of them. And that process the was, and that. was seamless. And we need to look at what happened then. Now, with what we have now, and I disagree, I disagree with them vehemently, because it must provide the, 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 the evidence of retrogression. I was part of that process. I was a journalist then. I was a guerrilla journalist. I was part of that entire process. Now, for someone to say that we've not learned a single lesson in 28 years, it depends on where you stand. Some say the cup half empty. Some say it half full. I see it half full. Again, it's a culture. And I think that we're on, on that path. Are we moving as fast as we should? No. But it, it behoves on every one of us, the electorate, those that are elected, those that go to vote, it builds on any, every one of us to play his own, our part. All right, I, I understand that uh, uh, Chief Ozekome's uh, audio situation is better now. Uh, Chief Ozekome, I, I understand that we can hear you better, but let me also make it uh, abundantly uh, clear that uh, we couldn't hear you at all in your initial statement. Yeah. That was precisely why. Okay. So that's technology. to make sure <laughs> that we could hear you, that we had to make the adjustment. So now I think we can hear you. So please, just go back to why you said you disagreed vehemently with the minister. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Very well. Yes. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, I, I said I disagree with the minister. And in disagreeing, I said we have not progressed at all. Rather, we have retrogressed because the situation is worse off today than we were in 1993. We have suffered the fate of the barber's chair of perpetual motion on its axis without progress. We have behaved like the bourbons of European history that learned nothing and forgot nothing. On June 12, 1993, Nigerians of all walks voted for a Muslim Muslim ticket. Chief MKO Abiola 
and Al Haji, Babagana Kingibe. They even defeated Bashir Tofa in his Albasa, Jadi Jadi ward in Kano State. Military, police, men, women, Muslims, Christians, atheists, they voted for their Muslim Muslim ticket because they believed in one Nigeria. They believed in his farewell to poverty program. Today, can anybody say a political party has a program that is credible or that when they come to power, they will even implement? No. How can we say we are progressed? When in 1993, Nigerians could queue up under Babangida and vote along the line without intimidation. Today, people are killed, even in their bedrooms, even after voting. Today, ballot papers, ballot boxes are merely stuffed and carried away. Today, even where they pretend to vote, the votes are not counted. So the will of the people is not reflected in the ballot box. Today, we have presidents, governors, senators, members of the House of Representatives, state members of House of Assembly, chairmen of local government council, councillors, being conceived, incubated, and delivered in our various courts of law, rather than by the people because of a fundamentally flawed electoral process where people who did not even participate at all are declared winner. Is that progress? Can you really say there is progress? Can you say there is progress in a system where there is now more mutual suspicion, more divisiveness, more ethnocentric intolerance in Nigeria between the Muslims and Christians? between the north and the south, divides that have become so, 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 wide, so widened that people cannot even travel freely on the streets. Do you know in 1993, I could leave Lagos at times by 10 p.m. with my young wife that I had just married two years earlier, and we would drive all the way from Lagos through Shagamu or Benin, and go to my hometown if you could near again a border. Today, can you even move freely? All the politicians, can any of them move freely without an armada of security as if a president or an army of occupation is arriving? Is that what we call progress? To me, that is retrogression. We have even gone back. We have gone back to a near state of the Hobbesian state of nature. Chief, Oge so Chief Ozekome, uh, I, I want to put you on pause and let you uh, and ask you the second question that I asked um, the Honorable Minister, which is that if in your case you believe that we did not learn the lessons, we haven't taken those lessons and moved them into the democratic practice that we're having, the question then is how do we do so? How we do so, one we have credible leadership that is transparent and responsible to the Nigerian people. We have a strong, virile civil society that holds the government accountable to the people. We have a restructured federation where all the injustices, they are not perceived, they are real. They are manifest. They are widening on a daily basis where these injustices are removed. Are we not celebrating June 12th? Today, Democracy Day. I fought for it. 2005, Vision 2009, and the, at the 2014 National Conference, I moved the motion that June 12th be declared the Democracy Day and not May 29. But we have not imbibed those lessons. Because the political elites, the political class, with their collaborators, both civilian and military, are all together like witches and wizards, in pilfering the scarce resources 
of the country. The common man is forever held down by the jugular under a constitutional dispensation that is unitary, that is not federal, that is outrageously skewed, religiously inclement, ethnically intolerant. Let me put you on pause, Chief of Zekome. I cannot say. Let, let me put you on pause. A suffocating system. Let me put you on pause. And why am, I let, why am I going to put you on pause? I'm going to put you on pause because I want the Honorable Minister to react to some of what you're saying, which is that if you think that we have imbibed some of those lessons, he thinks we haven't. Right. Uh, but he's saying that if we're going to, one of the things that I identified from what he said is that we're going to have to have a restructured federation. There's a constitutional amendment process going on right now. Yeah. Would you say there's a link between that and what his position is? Absolutely. I think he even got his answer today when the president gave his broadcast. He said Nigerians should look towards the National Assembly. I think that if, as Nigerians, we have embraced democracy, the processes of democracy, the institutions of democracy, we must allow those institutions to perform their roles. What is going on now is part of it. Something is going to eventually come out of that. You know, I've listened to Chief. I was one of those that chronicled, I was at the ringside. I was one of those journalists, young journalists then, that chronicled with Tempo and the news magazine, the AM News and PM News, that chronicled that era. Beyond the newsroom, I was also on the street. And I know what happened then. And I repeat that. The situation we had then was different, totally different from what we have now. It went in different directions, security, etc. I'm focused on the lessons learned at the democratic level. And I think you have the judiciary, you have the executive, you have the legislature. These institutions must perform their role. The tendency to always insist that the executive must provide all the answers. He's a lawyer, a well-respected lawyer. We must also look through the instrumentality of the National Assembly, the representatives of the people. See, whatever you've chosen, what form of government you've chosen, worse and all, you must allow that system to work. Even the people, the ordinary citizens, have a role. Elections that are rigged, it's not just politicians that go to rig. They also use the people to rig. That's why those involved, you must also decide that you will not be part of the rough it will be a solution. So I still insist, there are lessons learned. Have we carried on the entirety of that lesson? Absolutely not. Has there been a change? Imagine if we were still in the military era. I knew what we went through under the military era. I know what we enjoy now, a democratic space. It might not be a perfect space, but it's an effort. It's a continuous effort we must make at it. Chief Ozekome, I'm coming back to you. We're going to take a break uh, at this point, but I'm coming back to you once we come back from that break uh, to respond to the issue of if you want things to change, if you want things altered, you're a constitutional lawyer that we should look in the direction of the National Assembly and constitutional amendment. That will be after the break, though. Please stay on with us. It is inconceivable that a few people in government should claim to know so much better about politics and government in our country than the 14 million Nigerians who actually went to the polls on June 12. It is gratuitous insult to suppose that any government, no matter how, imp how impressed it is by its own knowledge and wisdom, should, against the people's will, continue to make laws and regulations whose only permanent characteristic is inconsistency. This country is tired of their inconsistency. The people of Nigeria have spoken. Unfortunately, apparently, what the people said was not what they wanted to hear. It was tough luck for them. It is the people's voice that will be heard and will be heard and will be heard again. Yes. They have loudly and firmly proclaimed their preference for democracy. All right, welcome back. Uh, as I said before, uh, we went on the break. I'm going to go to Chief Ozekome straight away. Chief, Chief Ozekome, in introducing you, perhaps you didn't hear me at that time because 
there was that difficulty with the connection. But I did describe you as a constitutional lawyer. Um, you talked about the fact that we need a restructured federation. And the minister here has pointed to the fact that there's a constitutional amendment process going on. The National Assembly is in charge of that. And according to the law as it stands, anyone who wants things altered should go to the National Assembly. Do you think that's the way to go? And if, if not, and if so, why? Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, by the grace of God, yes, constitutional lawyer. I have a PhD, I have a PhD in constitutional law, doctoral thesis. Um, I remember Dari, I didn't know he was a young journalist, he was in Tempo, AM, PM News, and he was covering us while we were in the trenches uh, in those days. Um, myself, Ulisak Bakoba, had to found the first human rights body in Nigeria the Civil Liberties Organization, October 15, 1987. Abdul and Ghani was leading us before we formed JALCON in, in 1998, with which we pushed out the military. I have never, <clears throat> and let me be very clear about this, underplayed the role of the National Assembly under Section 4 of the Constitution. Nigeria operates a tripartite system of government, which Baron de Montesque in 1748 described as division of labor or between the three arms of government, legislature, executive, and judiciary. Indeed, Mr. Ari, is the absence of the legislature that I've always said made us to say we had a military junta. Because the military junta concentrated the powers of lawmaking and executed the same laws in the form of decrees at the federal level and edits at the state level. I have never under, underplayed that. But in trying to restructure this behemoth, this elephantine, this very unwieldy unitary federation, which passes for a federal system of government, how do we go about it? That has always been the question. And I have never underrated the role of the National Assembly. But the National Assembly, on the other hand, does not seem to understand what it ought to do. I took on frontally the Deputy Senate President, Senator Omo Agege, on this issue, penultimate Friday at the International Conference Center, where I explained on a blow-by-blow -blow account how to bring what you call about a people's constitution after a referendum. These are words that these people are afraid of. I don't know why they are afraid of referendum or people's constitution. It was done in Eritrea, in Bangladesh, in Iran, in Iraq, in Egypt, in Kenya, in South Africa, in Singapore, in Morocco. These people, even with a government in power, were able to start a new document called the People's Constitution which was subjected to the people in a referendum. As the constitution was done of the old western region, we brought about the Midwest region, excised from western region on the 10th of August, 1963. Now, a people's constitution must belong to the people, owned by the people, legitimate, indigenous, autochthonous, homegrown, believable, legitimate. And that is what the present constitution is lacking. The present constitution, let me shock you, Akari Dulu, Ari. The present constitution, or not to many Nigerians, is actually a schedule attached to decree number 24 of 1999 yeah. of the general Abu Salami Abubakar government. 28 members of the Provisional Ruling Council. Give it to Justice Nikki Trubi Pane, God bless his soul, to couple, to couple together. That decree number 99, number 24 of 1999, actually introduced a unitary system of government worse than decree number 34 or 35, which General JTU Agui Ronsi had promulgated in 1967, for which, which led to his death. Because he brought about a unitary system of government unitary. where we are men. Consumers without producing, quote Professor Cloud Ake, God bless his soul, we call a disarticulate economy where we produce what we don't consume 
and consume what we don't produce. Now, for a people's constitution to emerge, the National Assembly surely has a role. I have never said it, but they don't know that the role they have is not on that section 9 of the Constitution, which says they can alter the provisions of the Constitution. Because you do not alter an illegitimate child of bastardy, no matter the alteration. You, if Inama the prophet, the leper, had to even be dipped into the Vajodan seven times she before he got cleansed of his leprosy. Like, before, 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 before we go into theology, Chief, <laughs> Chief Ozekome, how do you bring about a people's constitution? Before we go into theology, Chief Ozekome, let me again uh, ask uh, you to pause. Honorable Minister, we, we, uh, Chief Ozekome's question had to do with the issue of going to the National Assembly and using the, cons the constitutional amendment process to achieve whatever means. Right. But... Now, but you had said the National Assembly is there. I've spoken to a couple of lawyers this weekend, one right. of whom had said the National Assembly cannot perform harakiri. That's his exact words. Right. Uh, that it cannot legislate itself through any process out of existence. Right. Uh, which some of what had been proposed, according to him, would en 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 entail. Where's the middle road in all of this? Well, I, I think I listened to uh, SAN, and uh, of course, it made some valid points. But also, I must point out a few things. We have a constitutional government, no matter its imperfection. And that government is in place because of a document, no matter its imperfection. Should this country then just simply throw away that constitution, and bath a new one. Because the argument out there is that, do we need a brand new constitution from the scratch? Or do we need the amendments that are necessary? Why can't we make the amendments that are necessary through the National Assembly and through our people? Who are those that will sit? It seems like he's saying that there's some superhuman somewhere who have an idea of what that utopian, pristine constitution of this country should be, and the moment the National Assembly agrees, they just come up and drop it. No, it must come through a process. And that's why we have the provision for amendments. I'm not an SAN, but I'm also saying with the little I know, the process that is going on, the National Assembly, that institution, you talked about judiciary, the legislature and the executive, why don't we allow them to do their job? And I think a better way also is for the SAN himself to inject himself into that process, become a member of the House of Representatives or a senator and get there and chair that committee and see the impact it can make. So I, I think the process that is ongoing, we can impact that process. I'm glad it was at the International Conference Center to have that conversation. And I think most of these things, Nigerians are watching, they are being documented. We should give this process the fair chance and the benefit of the doubt. But to think that some people somewhere will bring a brand new constitution. Who are these people? What are their ideas? And then just drop it. What happens to what we've had? Because we have a government in place. Uh, while you have the floor, Honorable Minister, let me you, give you a minute and a half to link this to the next subject that this program is going to discuss in its next segment, which is the role the younger ones have to play in all of this. I was taking a look at the statistics. About 47% of this country is under the age of 14. So you can imagine what quantity of people we have if you extend that to 18, 25, and so on. What role do they have to play in this process? Actually, about 65% of our population are under the age of 25. So we are, clearly we have a youth budge in this country, uh, which is attendant challenges, unemployment, uh, the desire for greater political inclusivity and participation. And I think... They often say that the future belongs to the youth. I think the present also belongs to them. But then there are roles and responsibilities on the part of government to open up the political space, involve the youth in government and governance. It's about three years now that the Not Too Young to Bill bill was signed by President Muhammad Bari. We've seen a number of our youth elected into various uh, positions. We need 
to encourage more of our youth to participate in that process. Beyond that, I think the issue of making sure that our youth have a career path, get employed, are lifted out of poverty, is really important. Of course, we, we, we hear they say, you know, I, I do mine is, is, is the devil's workshop. And we have a government that is engaging the youth, engaged in the process of upskilling them, of making sure that in the 21st century uh, society that we live in, where technology is an enabler, the government is conscious enough to make sure that several of our programs, not just through the youth ministry, but also seven or ten other ministries and a lot of agencies, are focused on technical skills, on digital skills, on making sure that we, we train them from training into enterprise, supporting them into entrepreneurial uh, areas. There's no country, I must say, that has been able to solve youth unemployment problem without placing its youth on the part of entrepreneurship. So you can talk about political participation, but even beyond that, it, everything boils down to are the youth able to pursue their careers? Are they fully and gainfully em employed? Are they also kept busy in those processes? But I think the youth have a role. I want to see the youth of this country play a key role, get into elective offices, hold the drivers of not just our economy, but of our politics in this country. Uh, now, uh, Chief Ozekume, uh, you are going to get the last two minutes of the segment. Um, and that's because I, yes, uh, I, I, I want you to eat, 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 eat. OK, please go ahead. He, he has the question, who are these super people, uh, these super human beings who we made the constitution, the super people, the special people, are the people, the Nigerian people. See, the National Assembly cannot give a new constitution. I will tell you, that is cannot around. amend the constitution and give it back to the people. It is the people that give birth to a national assembly, not around. the other way around. Their fear is that when the people want to decide, they may decide to say 360 members of the House of Reps of are too many and one are nine senators. Let us remove one arm, one chamber of the National Assembly, or make it part-time city. How does the National Assembly come in? I'm telling you, they still have a role to play. Instead of resorting to Section 9 to amend an incurably defective document, let them resort to Section 4. I agree with him that at least we have a constitution in place, no matter how, how bad, we have a National Assembly in place. Section 4 provides that the National Assembly shall have power to make peace, to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of Nigeria. The National Assembly can therefore, without doing something about amendment, and not a law, and they can do this within two to three days, the way they do first reading, second reading, third reading. They enact a law that provides for a constituent assembly and how it is brought about of the people, elected members of the people who will come forward, then their present assignment exercise, all the views collated from Nigeria, then the views of the, the over 600 views, some of the most useful of the 2014 National Conference by 492 delegates drawn from Nigeria. Then the 1963 Republican Constitution wow. provisions, like Section 140, which brought about a true fiscal federalism. You collect them together, hand over to this constituent assembly that Another you have one. ignited, that you have brought about, with a provision also in that law that you have passed regarding referendum. When the constituent assembly are done, Send it back to the people, yes or nays. Do you agree, for example, that the National Assembly should not be unicameral instead of bicameral? Okay. Eyes. The eyes have it. Then we have or, one. Or nays. Or nays. No, no, or nays. No, 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 we are not saying it. the National Assembly <laughs> cannot play a role. I'm sorry. So let I'm, them I'm, play a role. You I'm sorry, Chief Ozekobe. We're, no completely, we're completely out of time. I, I allowed you to complete that because I wanted you to complete the process, but we're completely out of time. <laughs> Let me thank you, uh, High Chief Michael Zekobe, yeah. Senior Advocate of Nigeria, uh, in our Abuja studios for your time this evening. And of course, uh, the Minister of uh, Youth and Sports, uh, okay. Mr. Sonny Dari in our Lagos studios. Thank you so much thank both you. for your time uh, on the program today. We'll take a break and uh, we'll be back with our second segment, this time with some younger people. Nigeria is a federal republic Remember the grace of God, indivisible, indissoluble, 
sovereign republic under God, by the grace of God. It will be a federal republic. Part of the problem is that it's always very difficult to, en to ensure federalism under the centralist military government. But that, 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 that will change. You had it very recently. Orders being given by the military president of the country to the governors of the state. That is not in accordance with our constitution. Maybe the problem arose because we allow this diarchy. But what we have now is a diarchy. We have the civilian regime everywhere else, but having a military head. The body is civilian. The head is military. It is this funny animal that we have at the moment that is given difficulties to, to everybody. Nobody seems to know what to call it. If you look at the head, you see the military. If you look at every other part of the body, you see the civilian. What is it? Is it the civilian government we have now or military? I think it's a quasi-military concussion of governance. All right, welcome back. Uh, it's a very short break. Uh, spirited discussion uh, on June 12, the lessons from it and where we are today. Now I'm being joined by some of those youth we referred to uh, in the first segment, uh, two of the cream of that. Uh, in the Lego studios here, uh, I'm joined by Timmy or Lagunju. Timmy, of course, is a youth mobilizer. He is uh, one of those who is very passionate about the subject we were discussing last in the segment, constitutional amendment, and what role uh, we, uh, uh, people could play in that. And then joining us uh, from Accra in Ghana, uh, but uh, uh, Zoom is uh, Indy Kato. Indy is uh, a gender uh, and, of course, uh, a, a rights activist. Indy, nice to see you once again. Uh, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Well, the, they say ladies first, so let me start with you straight away in, uh, uh, in Accra. As we have it right now, the youth, according to the minister who just left, uh, constitute about 65. If you take it from those who are 25 and below, you're talking about 65% of the population. Largely, they're either silent, I presume, or absent from the discussions about the future of the country. Uh, they confine themselves to social media. Um, can you hear me? Yes, please go I, on. I, okay, so I don't think that so social media is confinement. I don't think so. I think that social media has become the space. Presidents are on social media. Decisions are made on social media. In fact, while our country was clamping down on Twitter last week, the president of El Salvador was having a conversation about the new um, you know, um, currency that their country will be using on social media, on Twitter. So when we say, oh, Twitter is not real life, no, it has become. If all of these spaces are making very important presidential decisions, that this is the place you actually get the news first, this is where everybody rushes to talk about what is most important to reach a certain generation. And, and, and let's also say something, you know, culture is determined by man, right? So when we keep saying that it's not real life, it's like we're depending on culture from 20 years ago when these things were not relevant or did not exist. But if in one voice or in one mouth we do say that look, over 65% of the population of a country is made up of people of a certain generation, and those people communicate on social media, then I think that, my dear, it is the rest of you that need to catch up. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. I do, but I, let, that, let me put you on pause where you've gotten to. to let me, go, let me put you on pause where you've gotten to and take... Find out of it. Let me put you on pause and take your, that narrative to, to me here in the studio and ask him... Uh, if, as Indy points out, this 65% largely are in this space, uh, is it a question of them, as I asked her, which led to the response, of them looking beyond that space, or is it a question of those who are outside that space to go look for them on that space? What has been your experience with trying to get the, the youth bulge, as the minister referred to it, involved in the decision-making processes that Indy referred to? Mm. Well, when you talk about the decision-making process, you must look at it in two folds. Firstly is the fold of the circle of influence, and then the second fold is the fold of the circle of concern. 
right? And um, the truth about it is this. If you look at it, um, I think we're not giving young people as much credit as they deserve. Because um, when you look at the average Nigerian youth, the average Nigerian youth engages that which is within the circle of influence. So to a large extent, social media has been that which has been a tool within the circle of influence of young people. And you see so much of what young people have done with it. The same thing with the IT space, the same thing with the entertainment industry, right? Transformational, adding value and creating wealth. But the challenge here really is not with the young people. Because when you take the flip side of it, which is the circle of concern, right? And so what happens is that to what extent are we making it more accessible for young people to participate in the governance process? That is the key question we need to ask. Because when you look at it, right, for example, in some countries where democracy seems to flourish, you find out that there is an active participation of young people as children in the democratic process. In Nigeria, as a policy framework, do we have a fellowship program? Can the Minister of Youth say that we have an internship program that accommodates young people understanding the policy circle process in governance? Nothing of such nature at the national level. And so these things do not happen per chance. It happens by providing the platform. And so my challenge is to the federal government, create those platforms, those fellowship programs at the National Assembly, at ASO Rock. How many of the young people doing fantastic work in their communities have had the access to have an overseen oversight of what ASO Rock does? That's access. Start to create such institutional framework for access for young people and see what they will do with it as much as they've done with in the entertainment the, uh, and IT space. Thank you, Tibi. In the, uh, I'll come back to you now. And um, when you spoke earlier, you talked about the fact that the space in which the young ones are is real. It's not as perceived by others that it's unreal. But today, I'll put the same question I put to Timmy, which is when you talk about it and you say that, well, many of those who think that that place is not real happen to be those who may be in the decision-making space. So there's still a gap between those people and the youth in this space. How do you bridge that gap? Timmy has given some of the answers, but what, what possibly could you add to that knowing fully well our own situation here that gap, right um young people speak about these issues and then beyond speaking about these issues they organize and then they go out and the the, the thing the major thing that that social media does twitter especially the major thing it does is that it actually creates and dictates opinion that when people aggregate these opinions in this space it trickles down whether we like it or not um, prior to this, when I was growing up, I studied mass communication, and we know about the gatekeeper's theory. This is basically the breaking down of, uh, breaking up of the, of the gatekeeper's theory. Nobody can gatekeep thoughts anymore. The people decide the thoughts. And when these thoughts are aggregated, it trickles down. It goes down to, to other forms of social media that are not as open as Twitter. It goes to mass media, which is what we are talking about now, because for, to a large extent, to a large extent, Social media treated this happening what we talk about in all these other spaces. And then from mass media, it goes back to the people. But back to the issues is that after aggregating these thoughts, young people have had this conversation that we're having today. What is the next step? And we've seen the next we, we, we seem to be having uh, some difficulty with being able to continue uh, with uh, Indy. Okay. Okay. Uh, I... Okay. Fine. Can you hear me now? Please? Yes. Yes. Please go on, Indy. Okay. So I, I was saying that we have organized. We have had this conversation of we talk on social media. What is the next step forward? And young people have gone on several movements. We've had answers. 
We've had not too young to run through. We've had the sex for grades uh, uh, issue. Many things have started from this point and actually affected national discourse. Not just national discourse, we've been able to affect national laws. So it's not just to say that we confine, it's quite simplistic. And I, I mean this in no insulting way. That's quite simplistic to say that we are confined in this space. No. When you find out that the cotton, I want to use a Christian analogy here, that the cotton of the temple has actually been broken down and you don't know, you no longer need to go to a priest, talk to your, your, your savior. What do you do? You just walk in and do what it is that you have to do. And that is the freedom. That is the number one weapon that young people have in this generation. And we cannot look at it as something that is so, you know, it's just there, it's not real. No, it is real. On these spaces, you know, careers have been determined. Futures have been determined. The current conversation of Nigeria has been determined. And I do think that this is not a confinement. This is more than a confinement. Social media is now a determinant. Social media has breached that gap. It has broken the third wall. It is now real life. And it is on this space that young people have their power. Now, the conversation, I think, that says that it is a confinement, is a conversation that wants to read young people of their power. This is where authority lies. This is where voices like mine have the, the chance to break through. Because I believe that someone who is as stubborn and someone who is as belligerent towards authority as myself would not have been allowed on normal mainstream media if social media did not occur. Social media even changed the way mainstream media engaged in that even if you think that a person should not be on your space, that person can reign supreme, that person's voice is relevant in this space where you cannot control. And based on that, you cannot shut the person down and mainstream media has no choice but to engage those no, noted, noted. The last two minutes, the last two minutes of the segment belong to TB, uh, TB, she's talked about the fact that the spaces there are important for youth engagement in the decision-making process. But the question I asked initially about how do you bring those people in that space and the decision-makers together is still left uh, largely in there, unanswered, because that is where it appears as if there's a gap. Well, basically, the truth about it is this. Um, when you talk about that, you're talking about policy, right? How do you create platforms where um, young people's voices um, impact on the policy framework and vice versa? Now, that can only happen when um, I, there's a concept I call generational commingling, right? where we have, we do away with the current statistics. When you look at the average age of political office holders in Nigeria, you realize that the average age of a political office holder in Nigeria is actually 65 years old. And so in a population where, like the minister stated, that 75% of the population are young people, how do you have that kind of situation? You have it because there's a systemic disenfranchisement of young people. The minister talked about political participation. How can you have political participation when there's no conscious effort to realize that the cost of running for political office is not one of those costs that a hardworking young Nigeria like myself or like her can afford? But we want to be part of the policy making process, right? That is one key point. How do we become part of the political or policy process? when there is no cross-generational policy framework that bring young people together with the parliamentarian, right? Is there a yearly, quarterly, internship, fellowship program where young people across different communities are selected meritoriously and made to understand this is the process of governance and bring in their innovation into governance and so the key question is an institutional framework that allows for um, generational commingling and it is quite dangerous on the last note to know that um, the trust between that generation of political leaders and young people is fast fading away look that's where we're going to have to put it uh, at an end let me thank both of you very much uh, we had quite a, a limited 
period of time, but we had quite a lot of information within that limited uh, space. In the Kato, in Accra, Ghana, thank you so much for your time uh, this evening. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, thank you very much, Timmy Olaguju, here in our Lagos studios. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the time. And that is indeed our program uh, tonight, June 12th. The lessons learned, if any, have been learned. I'm Ladi Akari Duluali. Thank you so much. Goodbye.